Hi, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's episode, I speak with an artist uh, living in New York who makes things out of found objects, uh, objects that they find in their neighborhood, objects that they collect, that they use to make materials. They take these found objects and that's how they make the raw materials for the things they make. And in addition, have connections to other objects that they found in alleyways or on the street that they uh, put in this artwork. It's very interesting. I, I was very intrigued when, when I saw this person's work and the whole process is how it came about, where they're from, where the ideas came from, and even how they began showing their work publicly. It's, it's an interesting story and here it is starting right now. I'm an artist. I make uh, multidisciplinary art. Um, so anywhere from sculpture to video to sound to sometimes performance, interactive, tech, techy stuff. Okay. That's what I do. Where are you located at? I'm currently in Brooklyn. All right. Have you lived there long or? I've lived here for six, seven years, I believe. Um, oh. I am from Bosnia. I was born there. And then my family moved to the States in the late 90s after uh, the war. Um, we went from like Croatia to Germany, eventually to um, the United States. Uh, we moved to Florida where my aunt was living uh, for like a long time. Oh, wow. Kind of our like, yeah, sponsor because um, we were like uh, refugees when we came here. So, Wow. And that was back yeah. in the 90s. Yeah, 94. And then what made the move to New York? Did you go there for school? Did the family move there? Like, how did you end up in New York? Yeah, I, um, so I went to school. I sort of lived between Florida and Bosnia for a while. And then I moved to New York uh, for grad school. I went to Hunter College. Oh, okay. It, was that for art? Yeah. Yeah. I, I studied uh, combined media, which and is like sculpture, new media. How did you get started in art? Like, what were the first sort of uh, artistic things that intrigued you or that you started making? Yeah. So, I mean, I honestly started from like a very, very small age, like two years old or something, two, three years old. Mm -hmm. um, I would wake up way before my family would wake up, like at four o'clock in the morning. And I would oh, just be like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I would just be like, okay, I'm ready for the day. So I would um, go to the kitchen. I would gather all my materials and I would set up a whole table and I would be like drawing, playing with clay, all kinds of stuff. Very independent, confident child. Mm -hmm. Also like really quick. Um, and by the time everybody woke up, the whole table was just like full of like stuff, like material, <laughs> like uh, art. And then honestly, but growing up, I didn't know that people can be artists like as a career. I thought it was just, I thought everybody was an artist. It was just something you did. Hmm. And so uh, I wanted to be a doctor and I pursued that since, I don't know, for mid twenties or something like that. And then, uh, you know, I went to school for it um, or trajectory onto becoming a doctor and and then I left the country in 20, 2004 and I went back to Bosnia. I lived there for about five years where I, uh, cause I was so burnt out, like a lot of school, a lot of like, I don't know. I was just like, uh, and this was exhausted. like medical school or just, yeah, I was okay. going to school, um, to go to medical school basically. Wow. And, um, and then I was like, so I left the country and I went to business school. So I had sort of, uh, taken a, a pause on what it's a weird move Florida. okay it's a very weird move but uh, i went to because I, I arrived to bosnia sort of late and all the schools had already like uh finished their acceptance and the only school that was available was like a uh, school for business and tourism so i'm like oh, i'll do that and that way i can be independent i can do my thing mm -hmm. and um i finished that and then, but I was at the time around, I was always surrounded by artists, uh, like musicians, movie makers. And um, while I was in Bosnia, I was hanging out with a lot of really intelligent people, creative people. And then I realized, I'm like, I think I'm an artist. Like this, this feels right for me. So in 2000, I don't know, like 10 or something, I moved back to the States. 
And I was like, you know what? I, cause I never finished the, the degree before I moved to Bosnia. So I just was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to go to art school. And then I was really serious about it and I haven't really stopped since. So when you were doing that, you went to art school. Uh, what was, what was your intention with what you were going to make? Uh, were you just going like, now I'm going to be an artist or were you like, well, I do these or I paint or I sculpt or, you know, what, yeah. what was, what was the, I, I guess, what was the jumping off point? I, I, I don't know. I don't yeah, know a better way sure. to word that. Yeah, I was, I mean, uh, like at the beginning in undergrad, you take a lot of different classes, um, sort of to test out what you really like. And I really loved my design classes. I really loved uh, all my classes that required tactility. And like, I took some painting classes and 2D stuff, but printmaking actually was one of the things I really loved because it was so process oriented. And I just, I feel like I need, the process was important of like, or I don't know what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say, but like the process of printmaking is so sort of tedious and meticulous and organized. And I just really fell in love with that. But then also, you know, building three dimensional objects was super exciting to me also. And I, you know, I worked in ceramics for a long time. I worked in paper. I worked with wood. I loved wood. Um, in Florida, like the art community is very, it, it's sort of craftsy in a way, Okay. but it's like, it's also like fine art. So I had a lot of access to material, beautiful, like rich, like hardwoods. Um, so I, and I had really great teachers and I just kind of like, I don't know, carved my way through between printmaking and sculpture. I found out like, uh, what really kind of resonated with me and, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. It, so what was the, what was the, uh, I guess thing that really was a turning point when you went to school, uh, what that led to more of what you're doing now, I, I guess is what I would say, because uh, I'm building up to, I'm really interested in what you are doing now, but I want to see, I, I'm really curious to yeah. see how this kind of yeah, transitioned sure. into that. I, I mean, I loved a lot of like con uh, conceptual art, like especially um, like Dada work, like mm -hmm. uh, the Fluxus movement. I was really intrigued by it because it was funny. It was like, uh, uncanning. It was uh, intuitive, but also um, improvisational. And as a, like a intuitive person, my pro a lot of my process is based on sort of those um, initiatives, I suppose you can say. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's what sort of sparked my you know creative juices. So, so now moving up to what you do now, um, you use a lot of found objects and yeah. you sculpt them and actually use them to create materials and other things like that. So first of all, how would you explain your work? How would you, what, what would you call it? Um, I mean, I would call, I would say that I'm an object maker, a situation maker. Okay. Um, I like creating uh, environments and scenarios where people can come and interact with my objects and sort of get like a, um, like an outcome of some kind, like a cause and effect kind of a thing. Yeah. I love puns. I love, uh, quick, oh, you do? like, yes. <laughs> You're talking to the right guy then. <laughs> yeah. Like language is really important. I love, um, uh, what was I going to say? Like booby traps and like sort of slapstick humor. I kind of grew <laughs> up on like slapstick cartoons and, you know, Charlie Chaplin and, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Keaton, Buster Keaton mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but, yeah. Nice. <laughs> and uh, the work that you have, you, um, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting is like finding egg cartons and then turning that into like, uh, I, I don't know if it would be paper mache material, but like using yeah, that as sculpted cool. material. So how did that get started? How did finding these objects begin and then trying to turn them into yeah, things? It's, it's been sort of um, like moving to New York, uh, from Florida, it's a complete shift and complete shift in space, time continuum. I don't know. Yeah. Um, like Florida, I had crazy access to material and space. So I was making big things. I was making like 20 foot welded seesaws really? that were, yeah, like just anything I could do, I, I could make. And then I moved to New York and everything is small and vertical. So like, oh, how do okay. I, if I want to make something with wood, how do I get wood? 
how do I bring wood to my studio without carrying it on the subway or like spending tons of money on Ubers and renting mm-hmm. cars and whatnot. So I was like, okay, I need to create uh, I have this problem. So I got to create a solution. So one way for me to source material was finding it local in my neighborhoods. Like I'll walk around the streets and the, there's like stacks of egg cartons at delis uh, discard and it was free material. Right. Um, or like just random things on the street I would find. And then I would find ways to use it and create these, um, objects. Um, so lately I've been, um, you know, I've been working in ceramics for a while, but in, um, at the studio I am currently now, which is a two year artist residency called Hercules. Hmm. It's in downtown Manhattan. And, I, at, at, when I was in grad school, I had access to a kiln and ceramic materials and, you know, firing things was just very local and easy for me to, um, you know, produce. Mm-hmm. But then I moved to this res- residency and all I had was space and no facilities. So I was like, hmm. oh, but I really want to make pottery. I really want to make vessels. But how do I do that without, you know, carrying things around? It gets really heavy and mm-hmm. And things break on the way, you know, to and from. So I was like, well, I'll just start with paper. I'll figure out a way to make these vessels out of paper. And then uh, that kind of led to, well, I've been working with paper even before my residency, like um, Ed Hunter. Well, I, yeah, Ed Hunter, I was like sourcing material. And then egg cartons became important because it was light also. Very right easy to, it, it's always like a... Um, you know, like, uh, what do I do with my body also? Like, I can't be carrying around steel and wood and all these large things, so I have to preserve my energy, and paper was a really great solution to my problems. Yeah. And it was also, like, super messy, and, like, you know, I can get my hands dirty, and, like, the whole You're saying that's a like, good thing. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. my God. This, for me, this is where, like, ultimate exploration science comes in, and I'm, I'm just, like... I, I call my process like a wet kitchen. I just love getting messy. I love like alchemizing. I love changing things from one thing to another and finding, I don't know, ex- just experimenting and finding like uh, anomalies yeah. along the way. But um, uh, but also like paper became kind of important, not only for uh, like what I just said, but also um, so growing up in Bosnia, um, you know, it's like this place that, had multiple empire changes and multiple, like, it's never one thing. It never was one thing. It was always multiple, like, you know, Roman empire, Ottoman empire, Austrian, Hungarian empire, and then Yugoslavia and then Bosnia. And I probably missed a lot of empires along the way, but um, there, there's this beautiful architecture around and bridges specifically. And there's this gorgeous bridge that I love to death in Mostar, South, Southwest of Bosnia or Sarajevo, sorry. Um, it's a large arch bridge that connects two parts of the city uh, and between there's a beautiful river and this architect who built uh, this bridge like in the 1400s or something like that crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, he made a replica using eggs, um, using goat hair and just like combined a mixture to, con- really? create, to create a conglomerate to, cr- uh, to make like this concrete whatever. And that like story always stuck with me. So when I saw egg cartons, I was like, I can do so much with this, like, you know, and so I made this um, tombstone. Uh, It's just a it looks like a rock slab, but it's just made entirely of paper. And it really comes off as like a stone. And I've embedded little music boxes into it to create this like, I don't know, musical. Oh, you mean like the actual tune player? I don't know what that's called either. Yeah, Yeah, okay. They're like little hand wound. uh, They play like classical music most of the time or like happy birthday or like something like that. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Now, the how do you grind it up and like, yeah, so it? because pro- all I would uh-huh. think is I'd find egg cartons and all I would do is cut them up. I wouldn't think to actually make them right? like a malleable material. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to find ways to make clay basically that wasn't heavy that couldn't break easily. So I would uh, immerse them in usually hot water because I felt like hot water they disintegrated quicker. And then I would let it sit there for about a day or two, and then I would blend it with like. Um, like a concrete mixer kind of a thing. Okay. And then, 
I would add salt because I learned that salt would keep bacteria from developing and mold. Oh. And the thing, cause, because it's paper, it's an organic material, it's going to want to mold and get really funky. Like the smell is really bad. Um, yeah. So salt, salt was a way to keep um, things at bay and not piss off my studio mates and everybody <laughs> <laughs> around me. Um, but then that turned into like another thing, like what else can I make, uh, you know, mix into this mixture to create like a textural outcome of whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it just sort of kind of kept evolving. Okay. Now, yeah. on top of uh, keeping things, you know, so that they don't get rotten or anything. I mean, what I'm getting at is egg cartons aren't the only thing you collect. So <laughs> there you collect all kinds of objects that you find. And yeah. uh, it, now at some point, I mean, do you, do they have to be of a certain quality or caliber or do you like, how do you take care of these? I mean, it's essentially found objects on the street, which mm -hmm. can get kind of funky. So, sure. <laughs> so how do you, how do you, uh, keep away from that happening? Um, I mean, I'm pretty careful at sourcing things. Like I wouldn't, um, like I'll never take furniture from the streets just because bed bugs are real and I've had mm. problems with that. And like, I don't know, pests in New York is you really have to be careful. Um, so usually um, like a smaller objects I would find, I would wash, you know, like I found like a dentures on the street and I was like, this really is disgusting. But, you know, like you just. Add but still at the same time, it's like, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, OK, who lost this? Like, what happened here? I yeah. love this like dossier of um, the objects. Like, where did they live before I uh, found them? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's just like sometimes my pockets are full of weird things. And <laughs> yeah, it could be it could be kind of filthy, but like I'll wash it later, you know. Right. It's no big deal. Um. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, so first I want to ask, when you start a project, now you've, you've gone out and found these things. And of course you still work from just materials you have and things like that. Mm -hmm. But what is, what is uh, explain like a process for when you start a project? How do you normally go about it? Like what's a thought process? Do you plan it out ahead of time? Do you just start working and see where it goes? Like what type of way do you approach yeah. a project? Um, I've usually uh, kind of gone both ways. Either I have an idea for something and then I'll attempt to create it and fail along the way and then like try to correct it on my way to its like completion. Okay. Or I just sort of intuitively start pouring things and then see what happens and then it becomes what it is later. Um, so another project that I've been working on, um, Actually, for a while, I've been sort of obsessed with like pouring paint okay. onto plastic and then peeling it. And then you create the skin. Oh. And then uh, it's this really beautiful like material um, that I really started loving. But the problem was with the material, like when you hang it, it wants to rip because it's just a um, latex. Um, so then I was like, oh, I had all this thread. Um, and I, imbe I started embedding thread into this paint to create it like anti-gravity, essentially. Hmm. Um, and then this turned into like these kind of rugs. I started making these rugs or they're like tapestries. Wait, and of then, these paint molds? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I had then empty paint buckets and... I already had a vessel, so this was like an impetus to create more vessels. And then this is where paper uh, pulp comes in for me to morph uh, these. So all my vessels inter are actually like functional vessels, but they just don't. They're made out of paper and they don't look functional. Um, but yeah, they're embedded with these paint cans. So I'm trying to like recycle and reuse what I have already in the studio. Nice. Um, but yeah, that's. Or like if sometimes I have an idea, like I created this archway that was sort of inspired by this bridge. Um, it was like maybe seven foot arch made out of paper pulp. The interior was basically foam. Um, and then I covered it in paper pulp and embedded these music boxes and people could walk through the arch, play the music boxes. But then I made uh, this arch be on wheels and the wheels were mechanized and it, they had... Um, little sensors at the bottom and a motor. So as you approach the archway, it runs away from you. And like, oh. I just love that 
type of like humor i don't know like you want to play with this thing but it doesn't want to play with you so it just like runs the opposite direction now, how how um, would you how did you get the motor or did you make that was it something like where did yeah, that come from I, a friend of mine uh who works he's a, a programmer he helped me uh sort of like uh, formalize it because it we had to like find specific wheels and then these wheels had to be mechanized and so he built like this little Jerry rig basically these little motors together and then so like a created... raspberry pi machine or something like yeah. that okay yeah we had a raspberry pi and a couple sensors and then um yeah and he helped his daughter actually helped me with coding brilliant like 18 oh, cool. year old like oh, genius genius family but yeah they're long term long time friends of our family um so oh, wow just like <laughs> using my local resources and uh contacts that i have to create my thing nice yeah, so it's a lot of collaboration for sure. A funny thing uh, it popped in my head while you were talking about pouring the paint and uh, mm -hmm. then peeling it off. Um, yeah. It reminded me of something that I haven't thought of for a really long time. When oh, I was okay. a kid, I had this neighbor and she was out on the swing set in their backyard and she had this big jug of Elmer's glue, like the school glue. And we're talking yeah. like, we're talking like, you know, early in, you know, school glue in the 1900s. So, uh, <laughs> So she just had it and she was pouring it on her hand and then she'd just start swinging, right? She was just swinging okay. on the swing set and she had it poured on her hand. Then I came back later and she was peeling the Elmer's glue off, like it dried on her hand and then she would peel it and then set it aside and then pour more Elmer's glue on her hand and then swing, wait for it to dry and just did that constantly. It was just I just saw that she was just pouring glue, letting it dry and then peeling it off of her hand. And there'd be like this weird, like Elmer's glue sort of mold of her hand. And cool. she did that till she was out of the jug of Elmer's glue, which I'm sure made her mother Holy moly. angry, but still that popped into my head when you were saying, it, cause I remember just watching that going, that's really weird. But at the same time I was going, that's kind of neat, <laughs> you know? but there yeah, was no rhyme so or reason to it. Just sitting there by herself, yeah. pouring Elmer's glue on her yeah. hand and watching it dry. It sounds like there's a method to her madness. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. For sure. Yeah, there's something definitely skin-like about it. And it's also like clothing. And I don't know, um, there's this really beautiful quote by uh, artist Anne Hamilton. She said, um, cloth is the first body's architecture. Oh, I like it's that. Really nice. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, I don't know. It has something to do with it. But like oftentimes I would uh, pour things make these skins and then I would make these small little performances of me just jumping up and down with the skin and seeing what it does. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, now moving to the stuff that you find and then also these projects that you have and you're like, you're using things and reusing them from your studio. Mm -hmm. And you would talk before about how, you know, you just, your pockets would be filled with weird stuff and you take them back and store them. Now, you're not necessarily using them right away, and you're finding lots of things. So do you catalog them? How do you go about storing them? How do you know what's where? And I mean, essentially, put it, you can't just put them in a pile because that will look like garbage. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. how do you go about storing and, and knowing where these things are and keeping track sure. of the stuff that you've collected? Yeah, there's two ways. There's a pile of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> And there's um like I usually have like a wall and um, I'll pin objects to a wall and then I will write um, next to them like associations I have to this object. So, for example, when I first moved into my residency, uh, like walking around the space, it's a huge loft, like a building in um, downtown Manhattan, like Battery Park, Tribeca. Um, so none of my studio mates were there and I was just like I would put on some waltz music and just waltz around by myself. And I found this hair tie with a little pink bow and some blonde hair mm. attached to. And I was like, this is gross and weird. I'm going to keep it. And this is the <laughs> first object that I find in the space. So I pinned it to the wall and, and then I would write like found object at residency, Hercules. And then I would maybe write in associations I have with the name Hercules and maybe with the hair or the rubber band or whatever. So it would just become this sort of a poetic, uh, like, I don't know, a list. Okay. Yeah. And then sometimes people would come to my studio and then they would also have associations to these objects as well. 
And I, I would write that down. So I'm hoping that these lists sort of create like um, meaning of this object or like an idea or like, I don't know, give it something more than what it is maybe. Okay. And when you finish your projects, uh, you are still an artist and artists need to uh, live and, you know, have, be able to afford to create. So how yeah. do you, uh, how, how do you sell your work? Do you just do gallery shows? Do you sell work online? Do you have other things you do? Like how, how do you go about? Uh, yeah. I mean, all of the above. Okay. Um, I work at a gallery. I'm a preparator there. So my job is basically handling art, fixing art, creating exhibitions. Um, and so this sort of finances my art. Mm -hmm. uh, practice. I mean, hopefully I will just live off of my art. Um, but right now it's totally fine. Um, right. so I do that and then I show my work in galleries. I, you know, I post online also, and just like I'll sell my work through galleries or just my own self. So people reach out, they're like, Hey, how much is this? I tell them and they're okay. like, okay, cool. But yeah. So is there a way very, that you go about doing that? I know some people will uh, sell through their stories or, you know, uh, offer yeah, things or I'll, you just wait for people to contact you or how, how do you go? Like, yeah, what's your right method? Now, so right now I am actually, my residency is ending at end of August. So I have the space and I have all the stuff and I have a lot of objects that I like want to sell. So right now I posted on my story. Um, I have a, a column, steel column that has millions of little magnets that I've made. So oh. right now I'm selling all these objects um, through my story and people have like reached out and bought some, which is really cool. Um, huh. So yeah, I'll usually post and my, my st like, I don't post on my Instagram often, like my post post, but story time, is my favorite time, because I feel like it's more interactive. It's quick. It's like, uh, temp you know, temporal. So, um, and I can play with it and have fun with it and it will just disappear in 24 hours. Right. So, yeah. That is handy, especially, uh, it, uh, I didn't understand that at first when I was doing it and I'd be like, Oh, I'm th this event is happening and I'd post it on Instagram and then it's still there forever. And it's like, Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> it doesn't need to be there anymore. I mean, I know I can delete it later on, but yeah. <laughs> do you have plans to create a website or anything like that? Yeah, I do. I am really slow with that stuff. Um, a it lot of people me, are. <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're not me, alone. <laughs> it takes me a long time to just make whatever it is I make. But and then along with that, I have to make a website and then have to keep my Instagram going. It's like right. there's a lot of things and I'm I'm working on it slowly. But after I move out of my studio, um, I will maybe focus on that more because I'll have more time at home. I'm, I'm moving uh, basically everything to my apartment. And oh, you're going to work there. from home after you're out of there. Yeah, I'm just going to work from home a little bit, and then I'll see um, about getting a studio later. It's like right now there's a lot of moving parts, and I just don't want to overwhelm myself. Okay. In the middle of summertime moving. Well, I get that. Multiple yeah. moves, yeah. <laughs> well, and it'll always be there. That's the thing. Is like you can make yeah. a website at any time. It's Totally. It's not like there's a, not like the studio where it's like you have a time limit. You know, yeah. <laughs> and you, I do need to get on a website though. Right. Like ASAP. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not scolding you. I know you okay, need to get okay. to it. <laughs> but good and, point. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you just actually ended uh, at the time we're recording this, you just ended an exhibition uh, yesterday. Yeah. How did yeah, that, I did. Tell me I about did. that. Oh, it was really lovely. Um, it's at a, a little gallery called parent company. And, um, my friend, Arayal, who's a curator, uh, created this show with me and Simone. And it's like a two-person show. Um, basically, he works as a, he works in drawing, but he sources his uh, imagery from found photography. Oh. And yeah, so this was sort of our through line of just collected found objects. Um, and Rael wrote this incredible essay also. I can send you one um, yeah. about the show. And it, I don't know, it just felt so right and it felt so intimate and it felt, it felt really right. I don't know how to say it in other words because I think our, I mean, our work was so, looks visually very different, but contextually and conceptually, it just works really well together. So it was nice to have a, a you know, a conversation about that with somebody else. 
Yeah. No, yeah. it's in, uh, I saw some of the work from there and it looked, uh, it, how long did it, how long did it last for? How long was it on? I believe like six weeks. Something okay. like that. All right. And when did you actually start showing your work publicly? When did you actually like start putting mm -hmm. it in galleries and how did that come about? Yeah, I, I, um, the first show I ever had was when I was 16 years old, uh, in high school, my professor, my, I took a lot of art classes and my teacher was like, oh, wow, you're really good. I want to encourage you to keep making art. And, but I was like, so lazy about it. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and he would just like, he would just like push me and push me and push me. And then one day I had finished something and he, without my knowing, he submitted my work into a show oh. and I got it. So I got to school and everybody was like congratulating me. And I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, your work, you got a thing. And I was like, what? And it turns out to be, um, I was shown at the Dali Museum in St. Pete, Florida. Oh, cool. So this was my first little exhibition. I had a like a chalk or like a charcoal drawing. It was no pastel drawing. Um, and then in middle, I'm sorry, not middle school, but like uh, undergrad, I believe I showed a little bit. Uh, we had a gallery on campus. And then once I moved to New York, it was like, you know, you meet so many people and uh, artists and you're around so many artists that everybody's like, hey, do you want to be in a group show? And I'm like, yeah, of course. And then right. that's sort of kind of it's like snowballing. One thing leads to another or I don't know if snowballing is the right term, but like one thing led to another. Yeah. And, um, people become interested. I want to show sh share, you know, my work with everybody. So OK, kind of how it happened. Yeah. It's curious what would have happened if the teacher had not put the work out there you know yeah. it's one of those weird yeah. little things where at first you were probably like he did what and it's like oh whatever but really it's how you started to meet new people what kind of other yeah. opportunities would you say you got uh by putting your things out there how how had things i mean you hmm. said you had started meeting more people and able to start sharing gallery shows but like what other experiences uh yeah. were there because you started showing your work publicly for sure like uh people would connect me with like collectors like some this old collector guy uh collects only ceramics and he came over to my studio and was like i really like your work i would love to buy something and i was like okay amazing and um hmm. huge he has a huge ceramic collection and i asked him like what are you gonna do with this when you die and he's like I guess I'm just going <laughs> to donate it to an institution. So, but he has like works in the Met and like MoMA and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. I like, just, what are you going to do with this when you die? I, that seems like such yeah. a strange thing to ask people. <laughs> you I know mean, what? I'm going to ask yeah. people that from now on. That's going to be my first question on this yeah, show. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, what do you do? That's an amazing material, question. These are material things that we have to carry on and on with us, you know? Like, yeah. What's important? What do you keep? What do you discard? Yeah, it's it's something that I literally think about every single day, like, mm -hmm. um, especially like if you're like moving, like, say, like moving from like a war torn country where you have to leave all your belongings and then move somewhere and start totally new. And then you accumulate things that, you know, bring back memories, whatever, over time. And then what do you do with that stuff? Like mm -hmm. our attachments to things is something that I think about wow. a lot, actually. Yeah. I'm trying to be minimalist, but oh God, it's really hard. <laughs> I, I don't know how to not keep things. Um, now, it's, okay. Now let's speak about the future. Uh, okay. The what are some sort of uh, projects or things that you plan on doing in the future, or ideas that you have that might be coming up? People should know about, or just things you'd like to share, like ideas that you have that you are planning to do. What are what are some of those? Ah, oh, yeah, good question. Um. I, I, I might have some things coming up, um, in the fall, but for right now, um, I'm just like trying not to think too far into the future. Um, just because, um, I don't know what will happen because of my studio situation having to move out. So, um, I just plan on like moving my stuff and then continuing my sort of exploration within like building vessels and objects. Like I started making a chair. I'm really, really excited about. Wait, so, you like, started making a chair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's really exciting. I haven't posted much about it cause it's like works in progress, but I will soon. So I'm thinking about 
objects that we already use, you know, uh, in our everyday, mm -hmm. uh, like utilitarian objects. And um, so, yeah, I'm working towards that. Um, I'd love to build more chairs. And um, <laughs> I don't can know. You, we'll can see. you tell me more about this chair? I'm intrigued. Sure. It's um, it looks like if you combine Cookie Monster and like you wake up with a bedhead, like just crazy hair. It's sort of <laughs> like it's this blue fuzzy disarray chair. I feel like my cat will love it. There's something nice about like combing your fingers through this chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all I can say at the moment. Okay. All right. Yeah. I didn't know how much um, you wanted to say, but I'm intrigued because all of a sudden it's chair and I'm like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause like, you know, art is this thing that we have in our home or wherever. And we just like look at it. We don't really interact with it much. Mm -hmm. And I find like that's kind of a problem because I'm a type of person that needs tactility and interaction and touch and, smell and sound like i need to have a full body experience almost yeah. to get me curious about things so uh always i've always like anytime i've seen installation art or like interactive things in museums and galleries i'm like this is awesome because like these are the moments that i will remember you know there's like so much you know like you look at a painting you're like oh okay cool and maybe you get a connection where you can't stop thinking about this painting but i'm just the type of person i need like real world like I don't know, interactive within space, um, sort of to get activated. Yeah. Um, where was I going with the story? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that's all right. It's, um, you were talking about just more interactive with, uh, in, in the chairs um, being something chair, that you could right. use. Yeah. So it's like, I already have these objects in my house and, and I'm not always satisfied with them. They're just sort of, I, I like, this idea of like malle malleability or like mm -hmm. turning things from one thing to another change change is important um so yeah th this chair was like why don't i just turn it into something that i actually want and it could become a piece of art or piece of design or whatever um yeah okay and, and you know it's something that we need too so right. uh, we do we do need to sit i will say that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and but, do you have any uh, gallery shows or any other showings that are coming up? At the moment, at the moment, not that I can speak of, um, okay. but there might be something coming up. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. In the fall. So we'll see. We'll see. All right. And if people wanted to check out some of your work, where would you suggest they can go check that out? Yeah. Um, right now, they could check me out on my Instagram. Um, otherwise, I have one month left of my studio. So come by. I'm at 25 Park Place in downtown Manhattan. Um, let me know. DM me. Come by. Have a studio visit. Yeah. Okay. That's, at the moment, that's where I'm at. Well, great. And I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. Oh, my God. Yes. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.